Now, as you know, uh, I think it was July, we started to have a discussion on the listserv about succession planning. There was a lot of concern about this uh, proposed rule. I put the link up a couple times. I'm going to put it up just one more time. So this is the proposed rule uh, that the court has, the, the folks have put forth. Uh, a, we don't expect that exact rule to pass, and, and Dan will discuss that in a bit. So in response to all of the concern that everybody was expressing, we decided it would be a good idea to put together a, a program on succession planning. So we have today with us uh, Dan Siegel, Harold Goldner, and apparently the goat, Ellen Friedman. Um, <laughs> if they're all goats, if you ask me, they're all uh, very, very knowledgeable on this topic. And I very much appreciate their willingness to jump in on short notice and, and help put this program together. So I'm just acting as moderator today. I'm going to set step back. Um, I will handle any questions. So if you have questions, put them in the chat um, or raise your hand and I will call on you if it's an appropriate time. Uh, if it's in the middle of the discussion, I'll, I'll just ask you to hold until, uh, until it's an appropriate time to interrupt. But feel free to put your questions in chat and I will read them when, when it's appropriate. So with that, I believe Dan is speaking first. So Dan, why don't you tell us what's going on with this uh, proposed rule and, and succession planning? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Dan Siegel and I'm, I'm the chair of the PBA uh, Legal Ethics and Professional Responsibility Committee. And we are the committee that uh, advises and uh, on ethical issues. The issue of succession planning has been of interest to the disciplinary board for many years, and they have uh, had various ideas and concepts that they've talked about, but I think they, along with the Supreme Court, finally decided that they needed to get the ball rolling a little more quickly, and they proposed in um, in July, I'm looking at the date, but they proposed Rule 1.20. Rule 1.20, and I can't emphasize this enough, is a proposal, not a final rule. And there is no final rule going into effect at any time on this. So what I'm going to be telling you is partially historical and partly for good advice and planning. Um, the proposed rule would have required every attorney uh, in the state, um, if you had clients, to have a succession plan in place and a variety of other um, matters. You can read all of that in the rule. The rule itself, however, or the proposal, did not go into effect. There were many comments very quickly on the rule. Um, a large number from solo and small firms because Candidly, if you were anyone but a solo, you could simply say, my firm will be my uh, designated attorney, and you were done, uh, for the most part, under the rule. But solos would have had a much heavier burden. The uh, Legal Ethics and Professional Responsibility Committee, we formed a subcommittee led by Amy Coco, who's one of our co-chairs, our co-vice chairs, and she put together, along with the others, a extensive and very thorough uh, commentary on that rule, suggesting that the rule itself should not be adopted and it, uh, proposing an alternative um, geared not only to what I would call succession planning, but emergency planning. And it would have applied more broadly to that. We know that the disciplinary board is not going through at this point with the final rule as proposed. Um, Tom uh, Farrell, who is chief disciplinary counsel, has uh, indicated he's putting together a working group and he's going to be taking comments uh, from a variety of members of the bar because although, uh, at least as we see it, the plan, the proposed rule is well-intentioned and, uh, and a start, we don't believe for any sense that it is going to be the final rule or that it would be a good final rule. Part of that is because the focus on succession planning has always been on death 
And even when you look at this rule, even though it considers emergency planning, uh, the reality is that emergency planning is as much or more needed than succession planning because lawyers can have major emergencies that can occur. And if they don't know what to do or don't have a plan in place, it can be a dramatic impact on your clients who could have a variety of effects. You can imagine just whatever your practice area is. I can tell you from personal experience, having suffered a major medical event last November, that my office, uh, I was out of the office essentially for a month and it was as sudden as it was possible. We all we had, and we've discussed this many times, and my office is one attorney besides me, my associate and my paralegal. So we're three people. But we had discussed what we would do, God forbid anything happened, even though we hadn't expected it. Uh, that is the type of circumstance that needs also to be considered and the rule look at that as well. So right now, the rule as it stands is a proposed rule. Um, I've read a lot of commentary and a lot of comments from many people all worried, oh my God, that's going to be the final rule. We have no indication that that will be the final rule um, or that it's going to be anything like that in final form. PBA proposed a uh, rule. Uh, that would be very different in its uh, style. Uh, we were joined in comments by the Philadelphia Bar. Um, I believe the Allegheny Bar also made some comments, but if anyone could have made comments within the period. Plus, they extended the comment period because they understood that this was such an important issue. So from the rule perspective, it's not going to be that rule. We expect that there will be some rule. We have not seen it. It would probably be as this was circulated in the Pennsylvania Bulletin and not simply promulgated. Sometimes the, the uh, board and the court it can and will circumvent that and just make a rule and it'll go into effect in 30 days or whatever. We don't foresee anything like that happening uh, with this rule. Um, we're hoping it will be more thoughtful um, because for a lot of the solos, for example, if you designated um, another attorney, it could be very hard to find another attorney to do that. Uh, if you're in an area where there are few attorneys, uh, it becomes even a greater issue. Um, and there are a lot of problems with the rule as proposed. Um, and I think I'm going to stop and I'll leave it to the next speakers to talk about it some more in other areas. But that's what we're dealing with right now. Thank you so much, Dan, uh, for letting everybody know what the what's going on right now. Are there any questions for Dan before we move on to the next part of the program? I don't see any hands or anything. Okay. So with that, I'm going to ask, uh, is it Harold who's next? Yes. So Very Harold good. Goldner, uh, goat extraordinaire. Share your wisdom with us, sir. So um, I sort of the um the proposed rule was an enormous stimulus it was a kick in the pants um to me um the discussion on the solo and small firm listserv was extremely enlightening and the timing could not have been better because um i myself am looking to wind up or change my practice um um my wife is looking at a retirement date at some point in the future as well. She's also a lawyer. And we, um, I was chatting with uh, Judith Koenig, who's going to be speaking at next week's solo and small firm retreat on a program we're calling Moving On. And it was very clear my wife and I were not on the same page. Um, I always felt I could practice for a while. And then at some point, yeah, it would be nice to retire. I, I go to Florida every January into February. Uh, I work from down there. I've held depositions and settlement conferences remotely um, before. And, and I just sort of thought at some point things would taper off. My wife had a very different concept of what was going to happen. And when the rule came down, it was like, hmm, really need to decide what we're going to do here irrespective of whether there's a rule or not, 
The other thing that uh, that I have personal experience with is two lawyers who were near and dear to me died suddenly uh, or were incapacitated suddenly. And I was asked by spouses to, quote, take over the practice. Um, and I did not have the prior lawyer to sit down with and talk about what's going on in each of these cases. I had to sort of look at the and and files you know if you you know some lawyers are not as good at keeping files as others are um and in one case it was it was insane just trying to get into the files and figure out what was going on and the other um the lawyer who was a co-tenant with me um in an office he had a serious brain tumor and the brain tumor affected his executive function so when he came out of the surgery, he, he couldn't practice law. He was simply not capable um, of doing that. And so I couldn't really talk to him at all about his cases because he was incapable of really explaining to me what was going on. And it was a real challenge. Uh, and I did the best I could for, for both eventually widows um, but it's a real challenge getting inside somebody else's practice when you have no prep. And I was aware, especially when I was solo for 12 years, that if something like that happened to me, was there any way anybody could take over my practice for my wife and my three kids? So sometime this spring, I started the process. I started, and you know, improvisation is a great thing. We, we love seeing improvisation, but that's not how you do retirement. That's not how you do practice transition. Improvisation is definitely not the way to go. Um, you need to do it sort of the way you'd write a brief. You need to do your research and you need to you know, look at, talk to people who have done it before. And I'm gonna talk mostly from a 40,000 foot level uh, as opposed to a brass tax fundamental level, which Ellen, Ellen will tackle. Um, you, you need to if you if you have a spouse, you and your spouse have to be on the same page. If your spouse thinks that next March you're going to be retired, not doing any work, and you know lying on a beach somewhere in St. Thomas, and your thoughts are, oh, I'm going to be continuing to commute, I'm going to come come into town once a month. There's a real problem there. There's a there's a disjunction there. Um, I started by talking to lawyers who had already retired or transitioned to uh, an active litigation practice to maybe some ADR, maybe some counseling on the side, coaching on the side, and, and asked, what do I do first? Who, what do I do next? Uh, that was extremely helpful. Um, I talked to people who do some professional coaching about, you know, there are people, there are professional coaches who will help you transition. I happen to know too, Judith, who will be speaking next week is one. I know another coach who meets with executives who are let go from companies and, um, and they're not done yet. And they're trying to figure out what's their next project. What's, what's the next phase of their life. <clears throat> and it's also important to distinguish that because I, I, I'm, I'm saying retirement, but I don't mean that. I don't envision that a year from now or two years from now or three years from now, I'm going to be lying on a beach, whether Barbados or anywhere else. Fact of the matter is I'm not a beach person. I, we like to go out at four or five o'clock and watch the sunset. That's why we go to the West coast of Florida, but more of a, I'm, I'm an amateur musician. Um, there's community orchestras I play in. I intend to continue to do that. Um, I'm an amateur astronomer. And one of the things I look forward to not being full time is that I can go stargazing one night, not worry about having to get up really early the next morning for a court date. Um, and uh, so I'm I'm really thinking in terms of what is my the next phase of my life going to look like as opposed to, well, I'm going to retire and I'm, I'm all done here. So uh, and I, I mentioned Judy, Judith Koenig, who is going to speak next week. And one of the things she mentioned was this book, the link is in the chat, Couples Retirement Puzzle, 10 must-have conversations for creating an amazing new life together. Um, it's thick. 
it doesn't need to be this thick. I will say that um, it's like a lot of how-to books where you go, well, that would have been a really good article or chapter. Um, there's no reason I had to read 350 pages of that. Um, I will also tell you it's chock full of stories um, of examples, and you can pretty much skip those if you <clears throat> have a good head on your shoulders because <clears throat> you don't really need that. What you need are the points it raises, and I do want to walk through those points that it raises and what those 10, 10 questions are. And the first you have to talk about, and if you don't have a spouse, talk to yourself about it. Get in front of the mirror, whatever. But you really have to have these conversations and 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 decide how you're going to handle these. The one is if, when, um, and how to retire. Are you going to stop practicing law altogether or are you going to wind down? Um, you don't want to end up like, uh, you know, I'm on the uh, I'm I'm on the board of uh, Minnesota Lawyers Mutual. We have had at least one or two claims that were happened because a lawyer, an elderly lawyer who really should not have been practicing at all, decided they still needed to practice and their paralegals were running the office and their paralegals were committing malpractice. And so we ended up with those claims. You don't want to be that person. Um so you may you may decide you want to start to like I've decided I'm not going to take much more litigation about a year from now. I I'm not going to and I'm not going to take any case now that I think is going to put me in court in fall of 2025. And I've and I've told my firm that and I've said we need to get some litigation associates in here who can do my work because my practice is an asset to the firm and there's others in the firm who could do that and the firm could still enjoy it and I can teach and, and tell them how to do what they need to do. Um, so you need to talk about if, when, and how to retire. The second thing is you got to talk about the money. Um, is Social Security going to cover you? Is there going to be enough Social Security? Do you have a pension? Do you have 401k? Do you have money saved, set aside? What is going? What is the change in your income level going to do to your style of life? Um, that's very, very important. People have weird attitudes about money. Um, and some people are like, ah, I don't worry about it. You know, I'll always have I'll always have money. And there's others who are extremely insecure about having enough money to do what they want to do. Um, so you got to talk about that. The third thing is you got to talk about the change in roles and identities. Um, if if you're you know the lawyer who is bringing home the bacon and 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 everybody survived off of your income and you're going to retire first and so income levels are going to go down or you're going to be around all the time um you know i'm amazed there are people who practice law with their spouses i love my wife dearly we've been married 42 years this october but i could never work with her I could never work with her. And I'm going to be around a lot more when I'm working part time or she's going to be around a lot more when she's retired. And we're going to need to deal with the fact that, well, we're in this we're going to be in the same place a lot more often than we used to be. And is that a problem? Some people need their alone time. I like that time when I go up to Cherry Springs State Park and camp and just watch the, sky, the skies for a couple of nights. I need that alone time. My wife is a very avid bridge player. I hope to play a little more bridge in the future, but she's a tiger. <laughs> I don't know that we'll be sitting at the same table. So you need to be talking about changing roles and identities. That fourth thing is time apart, time together. Are you going to spend that time together? Are you going to travel together or are you going to travel apart? Um, you have to talk about intimacy as well um, and the romance of the relationship. Uh, that's the fifth thing. The sixth thing, you have to talk about where you are with your family. Um, we're we're contemplating moving to North Carolina where my son lives and my three grandchildren are. And they're right now, they're six, three, almost six, three and about 10 months old. Those grandkids are going to be, and, and I'm the only grandpa, they're going to be happy to see me for another five years, I think. And then the six-year-old is going to be 12 and he's not going to want to have anything to do with grandpa anymore. I mean, he'll be happy to see me, but I can't be underfoot. And um, you need to talk to your family. Does your family expect that you're going to be around the corner all the time so that if mom and dad want to go go grab, see a movie, can they dump the grandkids off at your house? Um, you need to talk to you have parents you need to deal with. I have a 90 year old mother 
who's uh, in in independent living, but she's not going to be in independent living forever. And I'm my siblings are spread all over the country. I'm the closest relative. What happens when I leave? Who's going to keep an eye on my mom? Who's going to take care of things there? Um, you may have siblings that are nearby. You may have family with special needs that you take care of or that you have a relationship with or people you want to see. you got to think about what's going to happen with your family when you move on from what, what is normal now. Um, the seventh thing, the seventh item is health and, and wellness. Medicare is a complicated mess. Um, healthcare coverage is crazy. Um, you're going to need a new, if you're moving, you're going to need a new primary. Um, you're going to, it's going to be a whole new healthcare network. Um, you need to scope that stuff out. You can't just transplant and say, oh, I'll find a carrier. Everything will be fine. I'll, I'll find a doctor in the yellow pages. Yellow pages? I don't even think there is a yellow pages anymore. Uh, I date myself by mentioning. Um, you need to, number eight, choose where you're going to live and how you're going to live. Are you going to stay in place? Are you going to stay in your house? Um, are you going to go into a 55 or older community? Um, are you going to move somewhere warmer? Are you going to move somewhere colder? Um, where do you want to stay? Where do you want it? Where do you want the next part of your life to happen? Um, you need to think ninth about social life. Um, I, the Pennsylvania Bar Association is a huge aspect in what I do and who I associate with and who I get to talk to. And, um, can I find another support organization like that if I move to another state? Am I going to wave into the North Carolina bar? Um, am I going to take a bar exam for another state? Um, what am I going to do? I looked at the, the um, apropos of that, I looked at the forms for waving into the North Carolina bar, and which it's, it's not cheap. Some people have told me, just take another bar exam. I don't want to do that. But they need they need to know every address I have had and everywhere I have worked since I was 21 years old. Now, when you're in your 40s, that's not such a big deal. But when you're approaching 70, looking back 49 years is a serious challenge. I, I can't remember everywhere I live, to be honest. Um, so you need to be thinking about that. The 10th thing is purpose. What do you want to do with your new life? What is, what is it you would like to accomplish? We all presumably became lawyers because we wanted to make a difference. Um, you know, I don't want to abandon my, my license. Uh, I know that there are things that happen that I'd like to help with. Uh, I know, for example, in Philadelphia's municipal court, in the landlord tenant court, there are senior lawyers who are mediating to keep people in their houses, in their apartments helping to resolve those disputes to keep people from being evicted. I would love to do that kind of thing. Um, I can't take that time now. The billable hour compels that I do work for my clients, um, spend time on the cases I have now. That pressure won't be so great once I'm able to sort of scale back and, and, and do something else. What, what are the other things I would like to do? I enjoy, I enjoy uh, teaching. I enjoy speaking. I mean, maybe... May, uh, if I go to a university or college town, maybe I'll teach undergraduates. Maybe I'll be an adjunct. There's a lot of different things I could do that could be fulfilling that don't necessarily involve the full-time practice of law. Um, that's my 40,000-foot take on, on the transition. Obviously, transition doesn't mean quitting and walking away from the practice. Um, I, again, I want to mention there's two sessions next week at the solo and small firm uh, retreat. One is Ellen's session. It's Wednesday, and um, they're going to talk brass tacks. And the other one is Judy and and Dave Fitzsimmons program called Moving On, on um, I think Thursday, and that's more conceptual. and And Judith will expand on a lot of the stuff that I talked about today because she was sort of the inspiration for for my talking about it. And the last thing I want to mention is uh, Nancy Conrad. Uh, PBA president has assembled a working group to deal with succession and surrogacy planning. And John and I are the co-chairs. I know Anne's on today's on today's call. And I spoke with Nancy yesterday um, at the federal practice uh, symposium. And I said, 
you know, let us know what the deliverable is, what you're looking for from us. And I'm expecting you to hear from Nancy. Uh, we should see her next week out at the retreat because the board's going to be meeting. Uh, the PBA board will be out there. Uh, and Ann and I hope to get that started and see what we can do to advance the ball uh, regarding all of this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Harold. Ann, uh, would you like to say anything? Thanks, Jen. I don't need to. Harold Harold said it all very well, and as did Dan, and, and I know Ellen will follow up likewise. So I will just go back on mute and enjoy this wonderful conversation. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. So thank you, Harold. Uh, Harold uh, mentioned a book while we were chatting earlier, um, Couples Retirement Puzzle, Conversations on Transitioning. I have put the link to that book in the chat. Uh, so you can take a look at it. What I will say, and, and Dan and I were having a quick side chat about this, is you need to remember that things can suddenly happen. When I was 45, I became disabled. And you don't, I, you don't expect to become disabled at 45. You don't go to law school and spend, back then, $100,000 in an education and think, oh, I'm not going to be able to work much anymore. So... I don't know the age range of the people here, but let me, as an example of someone who's been through this, explain to you that you need to prepare immediately out of law school, especially if you are a solo. You know, if you're in a bigger firm, even if there's a couple attorneys, as long as everybody knows how to access everybody's stuff, that's great. But they may not. Not all firms are that well organized. So one of the things you're going to need to do, and this will transition, I think, well into Ellen, is be prepared technologically. It's it's You've got to be prepared in your mind. You've got to be prepared on paper. But you also must be prepared technologically so that someone, whether it's someone in the same firm or someone that you trust to take over, can get in there and access stuff. And one question I did see, and then I'll turn it over to Ellen, is if we're using two-factor authentication, as you should be, how does somebody not within that system get access to my two-factor authentication? And the answer is there are ways around that with technology. There is hardware two-factor authentication, which you can purchase, and it's a, you know, normally a little USB key, and then you can plug it in. You could give a copy of that to the person that you trust or store it somewhere uh, where that person can get to it. So there are ways technologically to solve a lot of the problems that people were talking about on the solo and small firm listserv back a few months ago. I see a comment from Gregory. He says, I own my own solo practice and I'm 32 years old. Well, I'm not anywhere near retirement. I'm intending to mean to understand the process for emergency succession planning. Wonderful, Gregory. Thank you so much for saying this. You know, you never know what's going to happen. In my case, it was uh, autoimmune diseases that just made me so fatigued, I could no longer work. I was falling asleep, driving to the office at 10 o'clock in the morning. But for other people, it could be a car accident. Or you could be on vacation and something could happen. And it may disable you for a short period of time. I thought, oh, I'll be out of work for a year or two. Clearly not, folks. Life happens. Things happen. And so being prepared when you're young, as Gregory is doing, is the way to go. Especially uh, to protect your clients. And also your spouse, if you're married, or your partner, if you're in a relationship with someone. And your children to make sure that your asset, and in many cases, if you're a solo, your firm is your biggest asset. So Denise says, so my concern is not about access, but who is required to pay the attorney or paralegal who will be taking care of the files? Are we going to need to have a bond or life insurance policy for this? Also, how do we find an attorney where there are no conflicts? Will there be considerations for conflicts? These are all wonderful questions, Denise. And uh, some answers, Really, the first answer is you need to remember the attorney that you have to take over your practice, if winding it down, if that's what we're talking about, does not need to practice in that area that you practice in. Their job is just to keep things moving. 
So for me, and I've been the person for a number of people over the years, even though my, my main area would be ethics or technology, I can go into any firm that is well organized and say, okay, these are the files I need to deal with. I need to get in touch with this court. I need to get in touch with that court. I'm not taking over the cases. I'm handing them off. So when that occurs, then you need to have to deal with it. Um, so that's the answer to that question. Um, Harold mentions he has software on his phone and tablets and every computer I use, which holds all the information everyone could ever need. And my spouse and all my children know the master password and where to find the information. It's not the cloud either, just stored locally on the devices. So there's different ways of handling that. Um, yeah. Going back to- Jennifer. Yes, Dan, please. The other point is, unlike most other professions, lawyers have an ethical obligation to protect the client and their interests. So it's not just, you know, you can't just close up shop. You really have to be thinking about this because very few states have a rule on succession planning. But as a practical matter, it is an ethical obligation you take on once you have the shingle. So they have to, you have to remember that. And it can happen at any time. You know, I belong to a paralegal group. I was, I'm one of the few lawyers in it. And it's fascinating. And I've seen a number of times where paralegals have commented, my lawyer, something happened to them. And the paralegal can't practice law. And if things aren't set up to deal with it, it really leaves the clients in a lurch. We care about our clients. That's why we're lawyers. So we don't want to leave them in a lurch. When I became disabled, um, I had some clients that I was working with because I split my time between the practice of law and uh, marketing. And so I, I had enough time to wind down my practice. Uh, Denise, your hand is up. Go ahead. And then I'm going to come back to the other questions. Sorry, Dan, it's going back to what you said. And I don't I'm not saying this to be snarky. And I because I think I'm fairly well prepared. My my office is very well prepared. Everything is accessible. I have two fabulous paralegals that if an attorney had to come in here, could get my office and get clients. I, I guess my question is, is can that attorney just simply kind of oversee my paralegals because they can do it way better than an attorney can. But I get we have an ethical obligation, but if I'm dead, there, like, I, you, know, you know, I guess I don't want to be snarky, but I'm dead, right? There's no, you can't do anything to my license. I'm dead. So what is the stick going to, and it is going to be a stick. It's not going to be a carrot because most people here are going to need a stick. What is the stick going to be if you don't have a succession plan? What if because I think dead, that's is the question. Well, well I mean, if it's an emergency, obviously, it needs to be something, there needs to be a stick before I die because there is no stick after I'm dead. Right. I'm dead. And that's the stick. The, the, you may not die. Is the uh, I've already closed up my practice once. I am firmly right. aware of how to, to do this, right. um, and which is why I think I'm really well prepared now. But most people aren't. Right. And, you know, I guess that's the question. If you become disabled, you may not be able to practice again. OK, so you're going to take my license. That's not a stick. You know, it needs to be something yes. while we're competent and we're practicing. I guess that's what I'm saying. I know it sounds weird, but. Well, the only stick the, they've the, got the stick is, is, is our license. Is the the rule. stick is the, that you just yeah. care. Or like your it, carrier, you know. your yeah. carrier, your malpractice carrier may insist upon arrangements or not agree to bind you. Yeah, so right. that could be they may not agree or they may give you higher rates or because we're starting to see that more and more. As far as how you pay for it, that's going to probably be out of your billets. Like your firm is going to have to pay the lawyer for their time. They're certainly not going to do it for free. And that could be something you address in your agreement between whomever is going to take over. So let me get back to the questions. Uh, CL me, question. If I could, uh, Jennifer. Please, Dan. Yeah, the stick is the rule. Um, and it's been, it's very clear that disciplinary council wants a rule and they want it to have teeth. Um, so they have been dealing with a number of, you know, lawyers who, they find the practice, you know, they got sick, they died, whatever, and there's no plans. They're trying to end that or reduce the number. That's the stick that that's why they have finally proposed a rule. And I believe they're going to 
you know, there, there's going to be a rule. Um, and we are one of the few states that has any rule of professional conduct about that. And there's a reason for that. They've been preparing for it in the past, just with the question on the questionnaire every year. Um, and it's it's a matter of time. And while you'll say, well, how will they know? Uh, it is remarkable how when you don't have the, those plans and suddenly you get, um, as clients of mine get, it's a DB7 from disciplinary counsel. And when they ask those questions in addition, and that was one of the things that is on the proposed rule that they can ask that question, even if you're it has nothing to do with your with your ethical transgression. They'll get you, um, and you know. So 